2019 felt like a year of success for identifying and apprehending criminals. Although the Golden State Killer is the most notable example, there have been many more arrested for crimes committed as far back as the 1970s. Even Scotland's famous case of missing mother of two, Renee McRae, and her son Andrew, seems closer to being solved than ever. With all the joyous headlines hitting us as of late, it is easy to forget that there is still an abundance of criminals at large. Today, we look at three of those cases. Merle Marie van der Heiden. Merle Marie van der Heiden appeared to be a perfectly ordinary woman. Born August 5th, 1950, little is known about Merle's upbringing, although it seems she likely experienced a regular childhood and went through her teen and young adult years without hindrance as anything noteworthy would likely have been uncovered by this moment in time. In Maryland in 1979, aged 29, while working in the Army Intelligence Unit, Merle met colleague Francis Walsh. It didn't take long for their relationship to blossom, and in 1980, the pair tied the knot in what seemed to be a celebratory, happy occasion. Just four years later, on July the 4th, 1984, Merle gave birth to the couple's first child, a girl named Therese Rose. However, by this point, the relationship between Merle and her husband Francis was starting to disintegrate, and even having a child could not repair the damage or halt the inevitable split between the couple. It appeared that the marital problems between the pair were stemming from Merle's rigid rules, although it's unknown just what kind of rules these were. In 1987, Francis and Merle were clinging on to the last threads of their relationship. They moved to Hawaii, but despite their best efforts, things did not improve. In May that same year, Francis moved out and filed for divorce, and despite spending almost a decade with Merle, it appears even he did not foresee the disastrous turn of events that were about to occur. During the course of the lengthy and bitter dispute between the couple, Merle accused her soon-to-be ex-husband of sexually abusing their daughter. She could not prove this, and thus, without any evidence, her claims fell flat and made little damage to Francis's reputation or his capabilities as a parent. An investigation by a social worker and a psychologist was begun following these accusations, but they determined that Therese was being manipulated by her mother into thinking these claims were true. They also felt that if given the opportunity, Merle would take Therese away and never bring her back. Following the ugly divorce, Francis met and began dating a woman named Janice Anderson. On their first date, Merle appeared next to the car and began screaming at the pair. It's unknown how exactly she found them. Francis got out of the car, leaving his date inside, and began to speak to Merle privately, but this seemed to only fuel Merle's unbridled fury as she got in the car, sat next to Janice, and began to scream and shout obscenities at her before pulling out a stun gun and attempting to attack her. Luckily, the stun gun had very little battery power and so the attack left Janice unharmed. However, Merle did manage to rip out the car's distributor wire, disabling the vehicle. At some point in 1988, Francis was given custody of their daughter. It was determined by officials that Merle was not allowed to see her child unsupervised until she took a mental evaluation. Following this, Merle returned to the mainland USA, and Francis seemed to breathe a sigh of relief. At last, he and his daughter would have some peace and quiet. He seems to have truly believed Merle was finally out of their lives. Francis later married Janice, providing a stable and happy home for his daughter. She seemed to blossom right before his eyes, becoming less shy and reserved as the months passed. Merle made regular phone calls, but continued to remain in the mainland USA. Then, 
On June the 22nd of 1990, Therese went to daycare in her home of Honolulu. In the morning, the children of the daycare headed out to recess and then returned at 12 p.m. It wasn't until the children were seated that the teacher of the class realized Therese was missing. She'd reportedly been abducted by a woman wearing a hat and dark sunglasses. Immediately, the teacher alerted Francis, who quickly had his suspicions that the woman was none other than his ex-wife, Merle. The authorities were notified and a warrant was issued for Merle's arrest. Francis learned that Merle may have been aided by an organization called Children of the Underground, who supposedly help victims of abuse and their children escape their abuser. More specifically, they are known to help women and children escape controlling and violent husbands. The Children of the Underground are an incredibly controversial group. They have been hit with many lawsuits from angry and upset parents and critics of the program since the millennium. In one interview in 2016, the leader of the group claimed she had helped 7,000 people. The Children of the Underground is known to provide runaways with the identities of the deceased, as well as false paperwork, something which is suspected to have been the case with Merle and Therese. Despite the extensive search which followed, the mother and daughter pair have never been located, although there are unconfirmed sightings of the pair in Alabama, Florida, Louisiana, Colorado, and Texas. Francis Walsh went on to found Hawaii's Missing Children's Clearing House and, tragically, passed away in 1998, without ever knowing what fate befell his daughter. Merle Marie Vanderheiden is wanted for abduction by both the FBI and the state of Hawaii and has been missing since June 22, 1990. She is possibly armed and dangerous and is described as being five foot, five inches tall, 120 to 145 pounds, with green eyes and brown hair. She may wear wigs and requires either eyeglasses or contact lenses. Her ears are pierced. She was 39 at the time she disappeared and would be 69 years old if still alive. She uses several aliases, which are as follows. Jacqueline Smith, Pat Doherty, Mary Jean Hamm, Van Vanderheiden, Cara Johnson, and Cara Cochran. Therese was born on July 4th, 1984 and may use one or more of the several surnames that her mother uses. At the time of her disappearance, Therese was described as being blonde-haired with hazel eyes, three foot tall, and 45 pounds. She was just five years old at the time, and if alive, would be 35. She has pierced ears and moles on her back and shoulders, and was last seen wearing a pink t-shirt, pink shorts, and white and pink Nike trainers. If you have any information on the case of Merle and her daughter, please contact the Honolulu Police Department at 808 529 3111, or you can contact them via email on the Honolulu PD website. William Bradford Bishop, Jr. Born August 1st, 1936, in Pasadena. William Bradford Bishop Jr. is a former US Foreign Service officer who has been on the run for over 40 years and remains unapprehended as of 2020 on five counts of first degree murder. Bradford graduated from the prestigious Yale University in 1959 and went on to marry his high school sweetheart, Annette Weiss. The couple had three sons together and the family of five lived in Bethesda, Maryland, together with Bradford's mother, who was in her 70s. By all accounts, the bishops seemed like your average, everyday family, but that all changed in 1976. On March 1st of that same year, Bradford learned he would not be receiving a promotion that he had hoped to gain. He told his secretary he was feeling unwell, and left his office in Foggy Bottom 
a neighborhood in Washington, D.C., where he'd worked for some time. Authorities believe that upon leaving the office, Bradford drove to the bank and withdrew several hundred dollars before heading to Montgomery Mall, where he purchased a gas can and a sledgehammer. He filled the gas can and his station wagon, then drove to his next destination, a hardware store. Here, he bought a shovel and a pitchfork. Bradford returned home somewhere between 7.30 and 8 p.m. that evening. Although no one can be certain exactly what happened that night in the Bishop household, it's believed that Bradford's wife, Annette, was murdered first. His mother was killed upon returning home from walking the family dog, and then Bradford and Annette's three sons met their demise as they slept, oblivious, upstairs. They were aged just five, 10, and 14 years old. Bradford drove the bodies 275 miles in his station wagon to a densely wooded swamp about five miles south of Columbia in North Carolina. There, he dug a shallow hole, dumped the bodies inside, and lit them on fire by utilizing the gasoline in his gas can he'd purchased earlier. The bodies were later found with the gas can, pitchfork, and the shovel, which were traced back to Porch's hardware store. On March the 2nd, a North Carolina forest ranger spotted smoke and discovered the gruesome scene of the half-buried, burning bodies. The only clues that could be discerned from the charred mass were the articles of clothing with the labels of an expensive department store in Bethesda, Maryland on them. Authorities found that Bradford had bought tennis shoes at a sporting goods store in Jacksonville, North Carolina that same day, while witnesses say he had the family dog with him and was possibly accompanied by a dark-skinned woman. Over a week later, on March 10th, the bishop's neighbors seemed to realize that something was wrong. Nobody had seen them in eight days, and worried that something had happened, they raised the alarm. Detectives found a disturbing amount of blood in the bishop's home, on the floor, the walls of the hall, and in the family bedrooms. The bodies that had been found earlier in North Carolina were matched against the dental records of the Bishop family, and it was confirmed. Five out of six members of the family had been murdered. Another week passed, and on March 18th, the 1974 Chevy station wagon, which belonged to Bradford, was located. It had been abandoned at an isolated campground of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park in Tennessee. The car contained dog biscuits, a bloody blanket, a shotgun, an axe, and a shaving kit, which contained Bradford's medication. At the time of the murders, Bradford was taking prescription drugs for depression and insomnia. The car trunk's spare tire was filled with blood. One witness who came forward claimed that the car had been there since the 5th or the 7th of March. Police attempted to track down Bradford's scent with the use of bloodhounds, but this failed. The following day, a grand jury indicted Bradford on five counts of first-degree murder and several other charges. A motive has not been established as to why Bradford massacred his own family. There are some reports that Bradford's career had caused some marital tension. He was allegedly unhappy with his desk job and wanted to go overseas while Annette did not. She was studying art at the University of Maryland, opposing Bradford's wishes that she remain a stay-at-home mother. There are also many mixed reports on the severity of any financial issues the couple may have been having. Some say that the problems were mild and nothing unusual for people in their 30s living in that kind of neighborhood. While an article from 2013 says that the IRS was auditing Bradford's family taxes due to financial troubles, but this has never been confirmed. It has been well speculated that Bradford had intelligence training in the 1960s and that this has helped him to evade detection. Nevertheless, there have been several sightings of him across the globe which have been deemed as credible by authorities. In 2010, authorities believed that Bradford was living in Switzerland, Italy, 
or somewhere else in Europe, or perhaps even California in the USA. They suspected he was working as a teacher or was involved in criminal activities. That same year, it was revealed to the public that he had been corresponding with a federal prison inmate named Albert Kenneth Bankston, who had been serving his time in the US penitentiary in Marion. Bankston sent the letters to Bradford's US State Department office address, rather than to his home, but by the time authorities uncovered this lead, Bankston had already passed away, and thus, he could not be questioned on the matter. However, a lead did surface in 2014, although its promise was short-lived. In 1981, a body of an unidentified man who resembled Bradford was discovered after being killed by a car while walking along an Alabama highway, and in 2014, the body was exhumed for DNA testing. However, it was soon proven that this wasn't William Bradford Bishop Jr. Some earlier leads in 2011 had been dismissed via DNA as well. Reports emerged that Bradford had died in Hong Kong or France, but these were proven to be false. In 2014, a forensic artist named Karen Taylor created an age progression sculpture to suggest what Bradford might look like at his current age, which was 77 at the time. Utilizing this sculpture, a woman named Lisa Shepard created images which showed what he would look like with the addition of facial hair and glasses. In 1976, William Bradford Bishop Jr. was six foot one and weighed 180 pounds. He had brown hair and eyes with a medium complexion and build. He also has a six inch vertical surgical scar on his lower back and speaks French, Italian, Serbo-Croatian and Spanish in addition to English. If alive today, he would be 83. Unsolved Mysteries aired an episode on the murders, as did America's Most Wanted and The Hunt with John Walsh, but none of these programs seemed to turn up any credible leads. Maria Socorro de Rodriguez Lepine Dubbed as the Black Widow, it seemed that Mexican-born Maria Socorro de Rodriguez Lepine left a trail of devastation wherever she went in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s until she finally dropped off the face of the earth in March of 1995. Maria is wanted for fraud and questioning in relation to murder. Suspected of killing nine people, three husbands, two lovers, two friends, one funeral director, and one business associate, Maria can't yet be definitively linked to any of these cases due to a lack of evidence. Maria's long and chilling story began in 1970, when her first husband, Douglas Lapine, a retired military officer, died after an apparent fall in the family home, which they shared with their three children. Very little is known about Douglas's death, and it is unclear if he was cremated like many of Maria's alleged victims or what other suspicious circumstances surrounded his demise. Maria then met Thomas Brixen, a retired businessman, who died of an alleged stroke in 1977, just a year into their marriage. Apparently, six months earlier, he had also been attacked by several intruders who broke into his home. In December of 1988, Maria met James Piper, a US businessman, and they married within four months. James had responded to an ad for a rental house just outside of Guadalajara, although it's unknown if Maria had been looking for a roommate, had owned the property, or was simply a neighbor. James had several children from a previous relationship, and they were all taken by Maria at first. They thought that she seemed kind and well-intentioned, and that she would be good for their father. Just six months later, on September 18th, 1989, James and Maria went out for breakfast together. However, James never returned from a trip to the bathroom, and when Maria sent a busboy to check on him, he found James on the floor suffering an apparent heart attack. He died a short time later. Three days following the death of his father, James's son Peter, 
who had spoken to Maria when she broke the news to him, got a call from the US consulate. Peter found out that Maria had a signed document from James which stated that he should be cremated immediately. This was the first sign of trouble, as Peter thought it was extremely odd that Maria had such a thing in her possession. As far as James's children knew, he had not planned his funeral service or burial in any way, shape, or form, likely because he wasn't even old at the time of his death. Nonetheless, the children accompanied Maria to her home, accepting her invitation to have them over there for their father's memorial service. The children described this event as odd, and claimed she was trying too hard to show emotion. In a later interview, James's daughter, Tina, said, She's pure evil. The funeral service was bizarre. She was crying, but there were no tears. It's obvious that she was not feeling anything. However, that wasn't the end of it for James's children. Maria later attempted to pit them against one another in order to get their father's possessions, including two cars worth $2 million. The cars have since vanished, and the children of James Piper never received any money from their father's estate. From this point on, Maria kept a low profile, and in August of 1993, she reported her half-sister as dead. She received a payout of $100,000 in life insurance policies. Then she met and began dating Victor Lapine, who bore no relation to her late husband, Douglas Lapine, who was a wealthy Montana rancher. In June of 1994, Victor's sister Eva received the shocking news that her brother was dead. Maria told her that Victor had become sick at a restaurant and had passed away a few hours later. Following the death, Maria repeated her usual trick by producing the last will and testaments of her victim. She also showed a suspicious IOU for $100,000, the approximate value of Victor's home, which prompted authorities in Mexico to begin an investigation. Then, out of the blue, it appeared that Maria had died. Allegedly, she passed away in March of 1995. Her mother and three children received a $500,000 life insurance policy, but the insurance company, suspecting something was amiss, hired an investigator to verify whether or not Maria was truly dead. There's little information on the internet about exactly what took place during the investigation, but in January 1996, Maria's body was exhumed. What was found inside the coffin was some flowers, some wood, and a few personal belongings. Other reports claim that stacks of paper were found in the coffin instead, but all sources agree on one thing. There was no body ever in that coffin. On a hunch, the body of Maria's half-sister was also exhumed, and the same thing was discovered. There was no body, just objects inside. This is when investigators discovered that Maria didn't even have a half-sister, and that she had, in fact, fabricated the entire thing and impersonated a fictional sibling. Just a few days later, prior to the authorities questioning him, the funeral director who'd been in charge of both Maria's and her half-sister's burials turned up dead in his home. He'd been strangled to death. Maria is believed to be hiding out with her elderly mother and her two remaining grown children. Maria's third child, a son named David, was killed in a motorbike accident. He is believed to be the only member of the family not involved with Maria's schemes. She did not attend his funeral. According to news reports, Maria's children have since been charged for aiding and abetting insurance fraud and perjury. Maria is described as being 5 foot 2 and 120 pounds, with black hair and brown eyes. She is fluent in English, Spanish, and French, and was born on October 15th, 1939, making her 80 years old if she is still alive. She is suspected to be living somewhere in San Antonio, Texas. If you have any information on the whereabouts of Maria, please call the San Antonio Police Department on 210-207-7273. And there you have the facts. 
three wanted criminals who are still on the run. Please leave your own theories and speculations down in the comments below. And remember to like this video and subscribe to support the channel. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.